Hello, dear listeners. You're listening to the Game Pitch Podcast, a weekly chat between two pals that is all about video games and the game industry. Every week, we'll bring you the latest gaming news, hand out industry red cards, and pitch an all new game idea. The Game Pitch Podcast drops Monday mornings on the Project Nerd Podcast Network. It's the perfect antidote to your end of the weekend blues. I'm JD. And I'm Eli. Let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Game Pitch Podcast. I am your host, JD, here with my wonderful co-host, Eli, as always. Eli, want to say hi to everyone? Well, hello, listeners, and hello to you. J to the J. We said J. We said J. We said J. We said J. <laughs> JD, come and we want to go pod. Oh, that was good. How long did you rehearse that? Uh, Not at all. Don't lie to me. I seriously thought it up right before we we got on this like when we got in the dock i was like oh crap i don't have a an intro and then, and then that just came to me <laughs> that was excellent that was pretty good maybe you should not rehearse them more often because that was uh one of the one of the best ones yet great good <laughs> everyone thanks for listening we uh have a packed show for you guys today lots to talk about lots to talk about about epic um lots of news that they had this week there was a lot of pokemon lore that made its way online and i think we want to deep dive into that and then we're going to round the show out with possibly the worst pitch we've ever done and then i think because it's so bad we're going to have a bonus pitch right after um is that uh kind of a wrong the right track there you like i think so buddy yeah we'll just okay because we, we've been on this streak of a very similar type of pitch, and I think that we're going to stay in that zone, and then we might take a deviation from that zone, but then we're going right back to it. So we're gonna, we, we have to. We have to. We can't, we can't get away from it. <laughs> what, have you been, what have you been playing? Man, it's been more game dev this week, just yeah. really a lot of theory crafting, like just in the Google Doc, just deciding, cutting stuff. Uh, I mentioned this last time, but I've been watching a lot of uh, master classes by uh, Will Wright. And then yeah. I bought a lot of uh, Unity courses too. So a lot of the things that Will Wright has said, like there will be maybe 15 minutes and I'm like, oh, I knew a lot of this or, oh yeah, like I get it because I made game shows before or I worked in events. So there was right. like a lot of the same concepts and then he'll say something and then my brain's just like, oh my God, you're so <laughs> right. So he's a genius and it's just great to look at him and hear him speak because like he really is, a beautiful smart man and i think my favorite lesson that i learned from it is that like when the two games that are his most successful games are the two games that people repeatedly told him not to make like they were the games that he pitched and people were like oh that's that's crap or he pitched four <laughs> games and one of the four was sims or one of the four was sim city and every time people would be like oh that's the one i'm least interested in so the Crazy. thing that people haven't seen before or can't fully imagine that might be the best thing to go for, the thing that's new. So it's it's just like when, when he said yeah. that, I was like, holy crap, that's incredible. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, I definitely, um, I remember you told me you got the, that master class and I'm I'm really interested to steal your login one of these days and, and dive into it and kind of check it out too because I've uh, been in the same boat, not a lot of games playing, quite a bit more games making. So I originally was in the same boat with you and uh, doing the Unity stuff and then once Epic over the last few weeks has just kind of been going absolutely nuts with announcements on Unreal 5 and, and the royalty changes to Unreal 4 and a bunch of other friends that make games with me have all kind of been like, all right, we're committed. We're learning Unreal and we're going like balls of the wall, C++. So that's kind of what I've done. I've, I've switched off from Unity and I've been doing a lot of Unreal um, tinkering in the engine and, and writing some C++ code this week and just kind of getting my feet really wet in that world. And so it's been a lot less play. And every time I have some downtime, it's been reading about the engine, reading some C++ mm. stuff, and then just like actually getting into the engine and, and messing stuff up and building things. So yeah, what's the what's the biggest difference for you? Would you say that it's like the blueprints versus the coding? Or have you even got into the blueprint stuff? Yeah, no, the courses that I'm taking, um, they're they're not even focused on the blueprint at all. It's all like straight up code writing. Just like a really quick comparison, I'd say the engine for Unreal just seems quite a bit more robust in terms of what you can do in it. And and maybe that's not super fair to Unity because I didn't spend as much time in Unity as I did with Unreal. But like Unreal seems extremely powerful. Just what you can build very, very quickly in that engine is extremely impressive. So like one of the lessons I was messing with was all about terrain. 
And so it was just like this amazing tool where you can just sculpt out mountains just like with your mouse. And then it automatically is recalibrating the code on the fly for you. And it was just extremely impressive. So it's great. It's really fun so far. I think this will be interesting because I think I'm still committed to Unity. So it'll be fun to see our like dueling paths as I go forward on Unity. It's like those two guys that were like friends in high school and like one started <laughs> playing football and the other one started playing uh, basketball. And they're just, like, they're just like, uh, and they're just like seeing each other from the distance, just being like, but you're not on the squad, homie. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I think it'll be good. I think it's yeah. nice too to have that variation of like you're learning this different tool and this different engine and this different mm, kind of rounded out skill set. And I think a lot of what we will do in terms of game design theory will be applicable either way, right? Like yeah. what makes a good game will always make a good game regardless of where you build it, right? So I think it's just going to be cool for you and I and, you know, for everyone on the pod listening, we can share kind of what that looks like and what that journey looks like. And I think, too, one thing that we can try to do as we get our feet wet with it more is share stuff on the on the Twitter and, and things like that. Just kind of talk a little bit more about that journey. So, yeah. I'm 100% making Winter is Coming. If you guys have listened to previous <laughs> episodes, I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm going to do it. But let's get into the fastballs, man. We got a bunch of gaming news, 11 stories we drafted. If you haven't checked it out, our draft is exclusive on YouTube. We post it every Sunday. So you can go to you know Game Pitch on YouTube, check it out, and just watch the quick little draft episode so you can see what makes it into the show. Kind of a little behind-the-scenes sneak peek. Yeah, and it's fun, too, because not everything that we collect throughout the week makes it on there. And so you can watch the draft and kind of get an idea of our thinking of what we put into the show. And then you may notice the things that don't make it in. And that's another YouTube uh, exclusive segment called Extra Time. And so we still have those stories. We still want to talk about them. But we kind of do it rapid fire, a little bit a little bit more goofy, a little bit more funny spin on it. Um, so both of those are YouTube exclusives. But yeah, let's start. This week, I drafted a story that isn't explicitly video game related, but it was too good to not talk about. And so um, with all of the COVID-19 stuff going on, a lot of restaurants have adapted to have to go and take out and carry out only, which is great. You know, it's it's awesome to be able to support local business. I know my wife and I have been doing that a lot here to to for our date nights, trying to make sure we're supporting local. And so someone on uh, <laughs> online this week ordered a, a pizza and wings from somewhere called Pasquale's Pizza and Wings. And so the screenshot of this guy texting with his Grubhub driver went viral where he asks him, hey, man, like, did you pick this food up from a Chuck E. Cheese? And the guy's like, yeah, I did get it from a Chuck E. Cheese, but it had like this fake looking logo in the window that was like Pasquale's. And so it turns out that it was actually Chuck E. Cheese has set up this shell company basically that is sh distributing the food curbside on Grubhub and Uber Eats and things like that as Pasquale's Pizza and Wings. And if you're not a Chuck E. Cheese aficionado like Eli and I are, Pasquale is the mascot of Chuck E. Cheese. He's the mouse, right? And so um, <laughs> it's a, it's an absolutely wild story to think that you're ordering it from maybe some local pizza place called Pasquale's, and then you get a Chuck E. Cheese pizza, which um, I think stops being good after you hit the age of 11. And so <laughs> it's uh, pretty amazing. JD, this is a brilliant stroke of marketing. This is it the is. thing that I strive for because EA needs to take a page out of the Chuck E. Cheese handbook <laughs> and they just need to do, you know, Twitter had that game where people were like ruin a video game in, in one, like changing one letter. What, one letter, yeah. Yeah, they just needed like Bass Effect. If they released Bass Effect and it was like space adventuring and gathering people, we would wash away Andromeda and the ending Ooh. of three. Every, like, let's just make Bass Effect or Bass Effect and it's just like a, a, a dubstep mass effect in space let's just do that i'm on board with quick little subtle marketing changes to you know actually sell more product <laughs> base effect and bass effect are two very very different games you know, one's a fishing <laughs> game and one's a concert experience I exactly <laughs> uh you know just it, it lied with this uh, i remember my mind being blown when I got like, I think it's uh, someone, we, it was Little Caesars, I think. And they used to have the 100% real cheese logo on there. <laughs> and I didn't know that real cheese was a brand and not. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like when you realize that, you're like, oh, they're going to say whatever they want on marketing because we're just going to get tricked by it. Because real cheese is the brand. They do not use 100% 
real <laughs> actual cheese in Little Caesars pizzas. And the taste should have let me know that, but I did well, not know that. It's the same thing with McDonald's where they used to advertise 100% Angus beef and Angus beef was like the shell company that they set up to buy beef from where it was probably like less than 5% beef oh, and yeah. 80% sawdust. And But you could still advertise that it was 100% Angus beef. They tricky, man. They are so <laughs> tricky. Speaking of advertising, I want to go to my next, you know, pick or my, my first pick of the week, actually. If you haven't played the Mario Kart mobile game, there was a recent update that <laughs> it's called the Jungle Tour. And <laughs> this is the this is the thing. I actually kind of thought that handheld Mario Kart game was kind of bad, but then I played it way too long. You know what I mean? You know that thing where you're like, this yeah. is not great. But then you're just like, ah, oh, okay, I'm good at it. Like, can you just keep playing it forever? <laughs> So Jungle Tour adds some new uh, courses, some new uh, cart variety and all of that. But it's it's really focused on the Donkey Kong aspect of it. So you get Dixie Kong in there and my main man, Funky Kong, who does not get enough oh, shine in this world. Seriously. So I, saw, I saw Funky Kong and I'm like, damn it, I'm downloading this game again. So I downloaded <laughs> the game again and just wanted you all to know Funky Kong's out there. He's You, you can get him through, of course, the monotony of spending coins and grinding in the daily grind of the random characters but i'm gonna get that funky kong you best believe i know you will if there's one thing uh that you aren't it is not committed and so you're extremely committed to this cause and uh you're extremely committed to funky kong and i can Dude, I, I really appreciate that look funky kong if they put him in base effect <laughs> like i would lose it <laughs> That is the crossover we need. I'm uninterested in Mario and Rabbids. I'm extremely interested in Funky Kong and Commander Shepard. <laughs> Let's do it. That's the pitch oh. for this week. There it is. We got, oh. we got to it. In the- All right. Wrap it up, everyone. Wrap it up. Let's go. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can follow me at Mario yeah. <laughs> All right, so my next pick of the week is actually about CD Projekt Red, a game developer I think everyone typically has pretty – a lot of love for um Hmm. and so this week they actually overcame um ubisoft as the most valuable video game company in europe and so they um one that's insane right when you think about ubisoft and all the different franchises they have versus cd project red and they really just have a handful um i think that's a massive a massive statement to how good this developer is and how much fans rally behind them and the titles that they make. So um, this, this news came out earlier this week um, and it's basically that Ubisoft is worth right around 7.8 billion and CD project red eclipsed them slightly um, with 8.01 billion. So that's huge. It also makes CD project red the most valuable Polish company because their headquarters is in Poland and that's amazing. And it makes me wonder, this is before Cyberpunk comes out. And I wonder, and, and granted, it's before Ubisoft launches a lot of games this this coming fall too, right? Mm-hmm. I know we have uh, Valhalla specifically, but they've also showed, you know, some new Tom Clancy titles and sequences and Watch Dogs Legion. So, you know, I, I, there's obviously going to be some money that's balancing out here and, and Ubisoft very well could overtake them. But then at the same time, you think CD Projekt Red is hyping people up pretty hardcore for cyberpunk. I'm beyond excited for cyberpunk. Um, so what do you think? I mean, what, how do you feel about this news? I didn't believe it at first. I didn't think it was real. Yeah. I had to like look other places. And I guess, you know, like market value is a different thing than maybe total like if you were selling the parts of Ubisoft, like maybe each franchise might be worth more. But like current market cap or value stuff yeah. is, is, is different. But Maybe they're just not even spending the money that Ubisoft's spending on the amount of studios they own, on Unity itself. Because like, just thinking in my head, like CD Projekt Red doesn't even have a game engine or a game store or right. a subscription service that right. like Ubisoft has. They don't have this pipeline for microtransactions. They don't have microtransactions in their oh, game. So it's, yeah, so it just it's it's mind blowing. Congrats to CG Pro, uh, CD Projekt Red, and I'm sure all of their uh, <laughs> you know staff members that have any percentage in that company, you done did Are it. Stoked. <laughs> yeah, they're hype. It's like that one episode of The Office where the whole warehouse wins the lottery and then they all quit. That's basically what this, <laughs> they're all like. We're yeah, we made it. <laughs> they all they all they all cash out and quit. And then Keanu Reeves is just like sitting there developing the game by himself like, in a oh, room. Man. He's just like, oh, this kind of looks like the Matrix screen, but what is all this code? <laughs> Guys, like, uh, <laughs> what's your next pick for the week so let's talk about more game companies 
Okay. I think Naughty Dog has been, you know, for me and for you, uh, a developer that we've always admired and been a fan of, kind of like people are with CD Projekt Red there. Yeah. So something this week happened on Twitter. Uh, There's a new feature that was launched, and it definitely, it's, it's one of those things where uh, the rich and the important separate from the the poor and unimportant, because <laughs> everyone who was tweeting and posting, they're like, uh, and like little Nas X did this, and all these people were doing this. It's like, hey, uh you know, reply to this and I'll give you a hundred dollars or do this like in the replies and you'll get this. And right. all these people like Ninja, everyone was jumping on that train. I was like, I get it. I'm poor. I don't have a verified check mark. I'm not getting the Twitter update before <laughs> everyone. I understand. You're cool. I, I under and then like and then there's the other side of it where people who have a check mark or more followers than some people that are getting the thing are complaining that they don't have the thing. So it's like this whole thing. Sure. Where people are just trying to show off how cool they are and how they got a new Twitter feature early. And this new Twitter feature, it's you can limit your replies to everyone, people you follow, or no one. So that's or people mentioned in the tweet. True. Yes. Yes. You can do that as well. Now, this is a, a tactic that Naughty Dog is using now. They have limited their replies on their tweets now, and this is an in an effort to combat the spoilers that people are posting, the insider details, screenshots, stuff from the game that is leaked. And yeah. I don't know if I like this precedent that it's setting because limiting your fans interaction with your product is a little worrisome, but hmm. I know this is a very specific case because they're getting right. leaked and we're in unprecedented territory with this uh, game itself, but I, I just don't like the cutting the comments. I'm not a fan of it. And if, if a game studio can do this, there's going to be things that worry me even more where people can post incorrect facts about the world and life sure and then just <laughs> cut the comments so i'm worried i'm worried jd is this is this is uh bringing me uh, like more worry than cordyceps would and like the the freaking <laughs> fungi <laughs> monsters well, coming at me <laughs> so i think this is smart for them to do right now um because yeah. I, I think you're right in the context of the game a lot of it's been leaked and a lot of people have been really crappy and trying to post those leaks and spoil it for even more people and and the, a great place to do that is obviously on their official Twitter, right? Because people are wanting to see what they're posting, what news is coming up, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I think this is a smart place to limit it. I think the real telling part will be once this game's out for a bit and the spoilers aren't, you know, as big of a deal, if they turn it back on, then mm. I think it will reveal a very different um, a different side of it because I think it kind of makes sense. Like, and I actually don't mind if game developers and publishers leading up to a launch if there were things circulating limited this to help preserve the experience for everyone else but mm -hmm. the the real piece that has to happen is after the game's been out for i don't know a couple weeks a month i don't know what that time looks like yet they'd have to turn it back on because then that conversation needs to open back up because without that conversation, I think it, it makes it really difficult for people like community managers and like outreach teams to have that conversation with fans. And without that kind of two way conversation, especially on games that thrive, like if my an example I like to go to is with Destiny, right? I think Bungie is really active on lots of different forums, right? They have the Bungie.net forums. They're very active on Twitter. They're very active on Reddit. They have those conversations with players uh, because the game is like a live service. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great example of where you wouldn't really be able to limit those replies because then you're basically turning that conversation off, right? You're making it 100%. very one way. Mm -hmm. So I get your fear and I think you know, I think about it and I hope that we see those replies turn back on post launch so that they can say like, hey, you know, players may have found X, Y and Z bugs or something's not working the way it's supposed to. And I feel like a developer would want that information. So, you know, I, I, I hope they turn it back on. But right now, I, I like it. I like that they can limit it. So you want to know what my first tweet's going to be when I get the feature? <laughs> Please tell me. Pineapple goes on pizza. No comments Ooh. allowed. Everyone's just going to block you. Then they don't have it's to worry fine. about it. It's fine. It's fine. My favorite <laughs> one that I saw this week was, uh, well, there was two. So Twitter's official verified uh, account. So it's like at verified, I think. Tweeted out, hey, reply to this if you want to be verified. And then obviously no one could. Uh, the other one, I don't even remember who did it. It was just someone random on my feed uh, who didn't have the feature, but was just being a smart ass. Was like, anyone who replies to this, I'll send you a million dollars. 
And obviously everyone could reply because he didn't have the feature. And so his first reply to the tweet was, oh no. And there was like <laughs> 4,000 people that are like, sucker. <laughs> you done goofed this one, Brian. <laughs> okay, let's move on to our next story. Uh, JD, you want to talk a little bit about Bethesda? I did. And more specifically, I wanted to talk about Starfield. Um, it's a game that I'm excited for despite the missteps i think that bethesda has had recently uh particularly with you know fallout 76 and uh they just you know i think they have to earn a little bit of trust back um starfield is extremely exciting to me because it's it's a brand new ip so there's no real you know it's not like a sequel that is just kind of like a eh, you know another step in a franchise really it, it's brand new um i love the idea of bethesda taking their big open rpg experience and applying it to space that's extremely exciting all we've seen was back in e3 2018 where they showed the title of the game and a six second little thing of space and then that was it and we've seen nothing since then they've been very tight-lipped uh and even like there hasn't been like a ton of rumors or like leaks either which is i guess good for them um but besides that uh one thing that has happened now and it's hopefully pointing to the game being launched sooner than later is that on the official UK game website there's a provisional rating now from Peggy which is the group that rates games in Europe and so it could potentially point to this game making its way through the review system or at least submitted for a uh, provisional review and that's exciting because that might mean that we get some sort of information on this game. Even if it doesn't launch this year, maybe we'll get a bigger reveal of the game this fall for some sort of launch in 2021. Um, so I'm I'm stoked. That's good news, in my opinion. And uh, are you excited for Starfield at all? Like, is this something that you're looking forward to? It's tough for me. I've never been a big fan of Bethesda or their games. I know Fallout okay. 3 is a revolution. I've always thought their games look muddy to me. They're mm. people. So like when I was playing other RPGs of the ilk, you know, your your Mass Effects, your Fables, sure. and like they just had an art style that spoke to me more. And I've always thought Morrowind or Fallout, um, Skyrim, all of them have looked just muddy to me. So I haven't okay. been the biggest people, or like the, the biggest cheerleader for Bethesda specifically. But I, I do know that like, Fallout 3 is is a landmark right. game. I understand that. I know how Skyrim, like people doing the dragon shouts, the Fu Radus and whatever, they're losing their minds. So I've seen so much <laughs> Skyrim gameplay in my lifetime. But if it's if it's the same game engine, I, I've never been impressed by the game engine that Bethesda has for their games because you know people made fun of it. It couldn't even run on PS3. So I I wish them the best. You know, Elder Scrolls in space. That's that's gonna be cool. I'm like you know, it's gonna be like seventy hours of fun. I just I'm not the hypest myself. Okay, that's fair. I can understand that. I um, yeah. I mean, I guess all we can do is wait and see, right? And see what what comes from this rumor. But uh, I'm I am hype. I am in the hype train. So, well, I'm gonna ride your hype train, and I'm gonna do ride it. it all the way over to the Netflix town. Choo choo! Here I am. I'm in Netflix <laughs> town. Look at all these video game cartoons we have. We've got the <laughs> Castlevania, and we've got this Cuphead show coming. So, what I want to talk to you guys about is they showed a first look, a first reveal of the Cuphead show. Uh, JD, have you seen it? I haven't. No. Okay, it just it looks like Cuphead, uh, just a little more uh, zany, a little more Ren and Stimpy. Like if you poured okay. like if someone spilled Ren and Stimpy on the regular Cuphead art, this That's is what where it the, is. the show looks like. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 exciting to me because we live in a time where there's so many superhero movies, and there were so many superhero TV shows and comics that led to them being the main primary mainstream thing in movies. So okay. I still think we're about ten to fifteen years away from video game movies being the only movies that are made. But I do believe these cartoons are that first step to that. So there was the Costume Quest show that Amazon had. There's, of course, this Cuphead show Netflix has, the Castlevania show that is, is happening already um, on Netflix as well. We have Halo TV series right. coming. So there's just, I think, a lot of really good video game uh, stuff that's not video game coming. So the IP yeah. showing up in another space, I think that that's going to be our next 15 years, like just a really good wave of that stuff. So I just wanted to highlight it, and I'm excited for Cuphead. Yeah, and we talked about that too, not only in TV shows, but in movies. You know, we've, we've talked in depth, I think, about movie uh, IPs, or I'm sorry, game game IPs making their ways into movie. And so mm -hmm. I think this is, you know, another really 
really cool road to that. I think it's another really interesting way to interact with fans through these characters and these worlds. So that's cool. I'll have to look at that trailer. I don't know how I haven't uh, how I haven't stumbled across that this week, but I'll definitely look at it and take a look. And I loved Cuphead's art style uh, back when they debuted it, um, and it, it's held up. It's just so so fun and so classic and yet somehow it feels very modern and fluid it's just it's very well done so a tv show is a really great adaptation for that i i had a friend drag me through cuphead because i was nowhere near good <laughs> enough to beat it so yes it's very that game's hard dude oh my it's so hard yeah like we beat oh. it but that person beat it like it was not me <laughs> <laughs> you were just there like wow yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah cheering on like you got this <laughs> do it <laughs> you got this cuphead Mugman supports you from the grave <laughs> you were just you were absolutely the bait useless. for the whole, whole useless. for the whole experience i love it speaking of useless but actually hilarious so a fan of final fantasy 7 remake on twitter uh prina prina not quite sure how you pronounce it modified the game's save data to make a version of the game where cloud is always dressed up in a dress there's a scene where cloud is wearing a dress and hair extensions that's in the original final fantasy 7 it made its way obviously into the remake because i think people would have raged if it didn't and so manipulating that save data uh this fan has made it so the whole game has cloud uh dressed up and ready to roll and it is hysterical that's the only way to play this game honestly if i mean look if you're gonna be a bozo and do what you did to this game story-wise you might as well look like a bozo the whole time i like that someone took the time to do this um it absolutely does not change anything about the core gameplay mechanics and i'm very curious how much work this took but it's it's worth it for the memes it really is so for me, uh, there was a surprising amount of uh, no work that went into the the new release for this king- the next Kingdom Hearts game. So I, I text you this, and I want I want the listeners to know there's a new Kingdom Hearts game coming out. It's called Dark Road, Kingdom Hearts Dark Road. I had no idea this existed. And the reason is because I realized that I had blocked all of the Kingdom Hearts accounts on Twitter after three, after I beat it, because I was so angry. So I had no idea this was coming out. But then I go to all these video game websites. I, you know, when we were making the pod here, right. we were ingratiated into the world of gaming. I had no idea this existed. Apparently right. it's Zehnort's backstory, how he became evil. It's his, it's, but it's a mobile game. And I just don't, I don't know, but it, it, also it's delayed. It was, it, I guess it was supposed to come out spring 2020, which would be now. And apparently it's delayed. It would have been, yeah, a couple months ago, <laughs> which yeah. makes it even funnier that this game that was supposed to launch, you know, let's say a month or two ago, what ha- if it had been on time, I wonder if it would have launched and you somehow would have still completely missed it. And then the story would have been completely different where it would have just been you raging about how a new Kingdom Hearts game came out and you didn't get the opportunity to play it at launch. Okay, so JD, we're going to play a game called How Much Money Did Elijah Spend in Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key, which is the mobile game that led into three uh, that was like filling that two and a half, three year, four year gap between. So I'm just going to give you, uh, you're going to throw out a number and I'm going to tell you if it's higher or lower. Go. Okay, uh, two hundred dollars higher. Oh God, I'm done playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably in the neighborhood of three fifty. Buying stupid characters oh. and avatar upgrades, and like doing the Elijah. full Fortnite thing to get cards to use different monsters and upgrade them. But here's oh. the thing: I was telling myself the whole time, you know what? They're taking so long to make this game. It's going to be really good. So I want to make sure I give them extra money because Square deserves my money because I love them. Do you still feel that way? I don't. I was shot in the heart. Why do you think I'm so bitter about all this shit, man? You really are. Look, here's the craziest. Look, I I want people to understand the craziest thing about Kingdom Hearts 3. That there were payoffs for the mobile. Okay, so the mobile game in America was about six (laughs) months to eight months behind Japan. And it had finished in Japan when they released Kingdom Hearts, but it had not finished in America. So there were payoffs (laughs) and things that happened in 3 that the American audience could not have known about unless they went on YouTube and watched fan dubs of the Japanese (laughs) one finishing. It is that stupid. It is that ridiculous. Oh, that's amazing. I hate it. (laughs) Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. (laughs) Uh, like let's move. You go. Oh, no, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I won't stop you. Go. No, I'm so mad. I just, I need to stop. Like there, like you could be playing Kingdom Hearts three, and if you didn't play the mobile game, there's like this character that pops in and saves you and flies around on keyblades and does all this stuff that you would just not know if you hadn't played the mobile. You would just be confused as f. 
Yeah, this is a mess. This is a mess. I'm sorry. I, I it's really bad. I'm really sorry. I can tell that you're really angry about this. Uh, let's let's move on to something that will hopefully make you feel better. So yes, uh, there's a rumor floating around. Uh, there's a reliable leaker in the Nintendo community that is saying that we may see a new Pikmin announcement um, sometime in the next few weeks. And there's not a lot of data around this, but I think it's extremely interesting because um, I like Pikmin a lot. Do you, are you a fan of Pikmin? Huge fan of Pikmin. Okay. If, uh, if I were to look behind me, there are six Pikmin pins on my pin board right now. Okay, perfect. So uh, obviously you're into this. I like Pikmin a lot too. Um, and so the rumor is saying that we may see a port from the uh, Pikmin 3 version, which came out on Wii U back in 2013. Um, and that'd be fine with me. You know, if, if they don't want to make a, a whole new Pikmin 4, it, that would be awesome. But if it's a port of an old one, I think you and I have been big advocates for seeing some of those old Wii, Wii U, classic Nintendo library games make their way to the Switch. Um, and so if this is something they do to test the waters on that, uh, one, I think it would be massively successful. And two, it would make both of us extremely happy. So I'm excited to see if this rumor pans out. Um, it, you know, Pik- Pikmin's fun. It's it's a great game franchise. It's so It's so fun. It really is. Nintendo, put every single Wii U game on Switch. Just do it. I just want do it. it. A Kirby, like Wind Waker HD. Like, yeah, do all, it. Just, do, just do it. All of them. Every single last one of them. I you would just heard them on Switch. You just heard Eli has a lot of disposable income to put towards Kingdom Hearts mobile games. Imagine what he'd spend on these classic franchises on the Switch eShop. It wasn't like $350 all at once, on. okay? Come it was on. like it was like 12 bucks a month or like... 20 God. you know what i mean like it was over even worse <laughs> yeah i know it was like because there was like this thing where every week you would unlock levels and like get i don't even want to explain it it's so bad I'm yeah terrible. it's fine <laughs> figman's exciting i hope it comes out and this might be one of those things because there's been rumors that we won't get a direct and that maybe we'll right. just get smaller and smaller little just game reveals like, yeah just like how paper mario was so we might just have you know right before paper mario comes out there might be a, a you know uh, or maybe there's a june 15th video that's just like boom hey guys pikmin's coming in august get hype i'd be cut fine with that too if it was like a two minute little nintendo launch trailer like it's like they did for the new paper mario right there was no direct for it it was very little fanfare it was just like a hey here's a four minute youtube video like there's a new mario game coming and everyone's like what the hell like where did this come from same thing do you know for pikmin cool. i'm happy if uh, the Animal Crossing growing gardening stuff, if that is released as oh. the same day as the Pikmin trailer and they do like a let's grow summer. That would be incredible. Oh, Nintendo, are you listening to this? We are yes. writing your marketing strategy for you. <laughs> God. Speaking of marketing strategies, man. this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a racing co- cockpit maker. A racing cockpit's like those those things that have the... Uh, I don't even know what you call them. The, sh- the gears, the shifters, they have the steering wheel. They make, they make steering wheels for, we racing like games. cars. <laughs> room. That's why this is zoom pitch where we, we race cars all over the place. <laughs> so they released a new image kind of teasing their next iteration of their controller on Instagram. And it had a fake Gran Turismo seven logo on it. Right. So <laughs> this is incredible to me because one, they didn't get permission to, use that logo to sure. they made up the logo like they <laughs> they they made it themselves and then they had the audacity to yell at people for them doing this <laughs> have you read the quote uh no i haven't read it to okay. me let me hear it our team has recognized that a recent post by us using a logo has been misinterpreted by the media and it does not reflect any information on our end. <laughs> and we deny knowing any information regarding the launch of GT7. So oh my the, the big story here is that they this company leaked Gran Turismo 7 by having the logo on their advertising their marketing that they put out here's the rest of the quote there have been assumptions made in the media that are quite simply untrue. Quite simply untrue. You put the logo on what? there. What are we to assume? <laughs> Due to this, we have decided to take down the previous post. Our graphic design department used a mock-up logo. <laughs> oh my! God. That is circulated on. They used a logo, a mock-up that has circulated on the internet. They just used a mock-up from the internet. Like they didn't even make <laughs> it. <was> cool. <laughs> uh, we do apologize for any confusion that this might have caused next level racing wow so wait so then does this effectively 
like say that this game is happening then like I, I think we all knew it was coming out but does this basically confirm that they are making it i think so i think either they stepped in it and they have to walk it back or they like i don't know what's worse like what's worse if you announced a game that doesn't exist like how could your media uh-huh. department not know that or that you just made up a game <laughs> what's worse <laughs> uh i'm i'm looking at this logo now and that is incredible that they would just slap this bad boy on this advertisement (laughs) and you would think as next level racing that like forza and dirt like the games they have listed on here you would think gran turismo would be one of your primary you know oh yeah partners for what you're doing so either they mess they goofed up and they're walking it back or they are just idiots. They just shot themselves in the foot real bad. If this is, if what if this is the logo and it turns out that this was legitimate and they had it just because they're good partners with Sony, right? And they, they were mm-hmm. working on this. And oh gosh, can you imagine? Sony's going to be so mad. Yeah. And it was up. Everyone saw it. <laughs> Kotaku oh. reported on it, different, like multiple organizations. So this is, there's just a lot happening with this. And I just wanted to bring it up because I think it's funny. I think it's hilarious. I, uh, I'll i be very curious to see now if and when Gran Turismo 7 is uh, announced, if it is this logo, which would be phenomenal. Mm. Um, <laughs> man, I feel bad for this next level racing kind of because I think they just effectively like lost one of their core partners if they just leaked this game ahead of the announcement. That seems like a fair punishment, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, if I'd be Sony? furious. I'd be so mad. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Poor guys. Let's round it out. Our last pick of the week in our fastballs here. Uh, so there is a game on the App Store and on Google Play, for so iOS and Google, uh, called Area F2, which is a base, it, basically it's a Rainbow Six Siege clone, right? Um, and it is very, very blatantly a knockoff of Rainbow Six Siege. Like... It, so much so, like, couldn't even begin to imagine, like, how they got away with this so long. And so now Ubisoft is suing both Apple and Google for allowing this clone to exist in their stores. And, um, yeah, I mean, I I absolutely side with Ubisoft here. I think this was a pretty blatant uh, knockoff, and I think Apple and Google should have responded to this quite a bit quicker. Um, one thing to kind of piggyback on this story too, is it seems like, uh, the makers of area F2 are going to pull the game and they are issuing refunds to people from what I read. That's all well and good. Um, and I still think that there's some sort of restitution needed from Apple and Google. Um, but this, you know, we talked about copies and clones, um, on the show before, and this one was a pretty blatant ripoff and it's, it's one of ubisoft's like most valuable franchises in my opinion just if you look at the legs you look at the competitive esports scene you look at active player base like siege is still massive um and this to have something like this floating around on two very big mobile platforms just seems insane to me well i can't understand how some people can sue for like how different does it have to be for you to not get sued like why is nintendo not suing you know that nexomon company that we talked about before because that game is just a pokemon (laughs) ripoff and i understand why ubisoft suing because someone having a game that is your game essentially can do damage to your brand it can if 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 the connection isn't as good if they get you know if there's lag or it's choppy or there's something that's wrong with the game they can think that that's a different game so i understand that but it just seems weird to me how you can sue one maybe nintendo just doesn't care because they get ripped off all the time i don't i don't know I, it's 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 weird that like ubisoft would be like yeah we're suing these guys and then nintendo's not suing that other company i wonder rip off. i wonder uh you know once that game launches that nexomon game what if nintendo's letting them just make this game like they're building up to it and then the second it launches they hit him with a ton of lawsuits so they burn through all of their development money and like have these obligations and then nintendo just absolutely hammers them at launch when they absolutely need to be selling copies of this game to make it back up and they're just like okay now we're gonna wreck you that could be it. That could be the strategy. But I think that this is a <laughs> sequel, and I think it's already on PC, and it's only coming to consoles. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it could be coming. We could that could be a cover a story we cover in the future on the show. But it's just weird to me. Like, what you? I mean, like, is Ghost Recon 
Rainbow Six. It's like, where's the line? Like, wh- how, what? How much has to be changed for it to not be a ripoff? I know that this one was yeah. a blatant ripoff, but what? What could they have changed to make it not suitable? I don't know. I guess I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say, right? Like, it's tough to know what that line is, and I'm sure there are lawyers that are really versed in like the intellectual property side of things that could tell mm-hmm. you, like, hey, here's some thresholds, right? Um, but it is tough to see a game like Nexomon. It is tough to see this like area F2, which are like, oh, hey, like that's Pokemon. Oh, hey, that's Rainbow Six Siege, right? And like, how are they existing in this world where much, much, much more valuable, powerful companies could absolutely squash them sooner and they, they're just there, right? I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. It No, it makes absolutely zero sense. And JD, I actually just realized as we got to the end of our... Uh, <laughs> stories here that uh, there, there's a story that we absolutely need to talk about this week that did not make it into the, the <laughs> any uh, didn't make it into the doc uh, do you want me to bring it up now or later because it's no. just just real quick. D- just do it do it serious sam coming to stadia get ready oh no yes how did we forget <laughs> how did about we forget this? that we got to talk about this oh. real quick i, I was right. looking i was like oh wait shit how do we forget this okay <laughs> so so you go tell the people what's going on Okay, so Serious Sam 4, uh, there was a little trailer that came out, um, geez, that was like two or three days ago, right? Uh, Devolver Digital put it out, which I love Devolver. Those dudes are incredible. Um, And it basically, like nothing was announced. Like there's, there was no like real fanfare to it. They just kind of put this trailer out. Um, But the best part about this is that it's exclusive to Stadia at launch. So it won't be on... (laughs) playstation or xbox until 2021 it will only be on stadia um and How? i don't get it i'm not sure like who <laughs> thought this was a good idea well like um, okay if you were to give like i'm trying to think what's the franchise like if they're like gears tactics is only coming to you know i mean like obviously because it's a microsoft thing that's what sure happen, sure sure i need a bigger game because man Serious Sam is not a good game, but boy, is it a good game. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, it's so weird because it isn't a good game, but it is in its own right, a really good game. Like, yeah. and so the trailer they showed has like tons of enemies and they're, they're saying that there's going to be able to handle like thousands of enemies. Um, it, it, it <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of this news. <laughs> So our good friends, Jade and Shannon, who we always pitch to, they're sitting in the office and they're you know, like, you know what we really need? This Doom Eternal game. I like it a lot. Is there a way <laughs> that we could get the Kmart of Doom games on Stadia? We need Stadia? the blue light special of Doom. We need the How buy we- one, get one free Doom. We need that. They did it, Stadia. dude. They, they, they achieved their goal. Jade, Shannon, you did it. <laughs> like this is it this if this doesn't boost stadia through the stratosphere i don't know what would dude on a more serious note because like we could joke about this all day i'm sure we could we could do it another 45 minutes joking about this but yes like from a business perspective how is that like does serious sam being on stage like that wouldn't make you buy a stadia i know it's not making me buy a stadia and i don't no. have any friends that i think it would make buy a stadia either no like one this is a weird franchise to hype this with like serious sam we haven't seen a serious sam game since 2011 Mm -hmm. um so it's been a decade right so it's not like this game is something that i think people have been really like fawning over because otherwise we probably would have seen something a lot sooner um so it it's been pretty much dormant for 10 years uh back in 2018 there was a little bit of a you know reveal ish they talked about the game and then it went away for a while and now they're saying hey we're gonna have this game out in 2020 so 10 years later and then to be like by the way it's only on stadia (laughs) this doesn't feel like the right way to revive a franchise like this like if you are trying to get people excited for serious sam why in the world would you limit it at launch to a platform that has a very 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 small install base So it makes less sense to me when I think about it from Devolver Digital's point of view. For Stadia, they're hyped to have anything I think that they can call an exclusive. At this point, I don't think they're being picky um, and saying like, oh, well, Serious Sam 4, like, do we really want that on Stadia? I think they're like, we want literally every game that we can put on Stadia. It does not matter what it is. Um, 
<laughs> you're you're right about the devolver digital thing because i couldn't fathom like why they would make this choice but then i yeah. remembered oh yeah google has all the money so that google was like here's this check and they were like well i guess we'll take this to the bank and Let's... then if you're if you're sony or microsoft you're kind of like eh, like go ahead be stadia exclusive and let us know how that works out for you and so a lot of stories originally when they were uh when they were reporting this were like oh it's stadia exclusive it's stadia exclusive well if you go back and look at a lot of those stories now um, there's like update headlines and like updates to the to the top paragraph. They're like, oh, by the way, it is actually going to come on Xbox and PlayStation Two, so or PlayStation as well, not PS Two, though it does kind of <laughs> look like PS Two. Um, but so so you can definitely tell like they walked that back a little bit to be like, yeah, it is Stadia just at launch though, and then like and then you'll be able to get it on these other platforms. <laughs> oh my God, we promise, please play it. Like, yeah. please, <laughs> please, please don't write us off. <laughs> Okay, sorry to hijack the show there, but I just forgot about that. And that was something we had to go into. We had to talk about that. We had to. So, you know what? A place that we always go into, your island, JD. Take me to Animal Crossing land. Yeah, let's let's talk. We got two quick stories. Um, well, you know, we have two quick main stories and then just some little anecdotal things we'll share. So uh, going on right now in Animal Crossing is the International Museum Day. Just a small little event that they're doing. It's it's nothing crazy, right? It's... um. Yeah, they they basically you go into your museum and there's little stamp stations and it's just encouraging people I think to spend time in this building which I think a lot of people if you play the game you know kind of like I do you run into the museum and you talk to Blathers you get your fossils assessed he tells you that you already have them all and you leave right and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't spend as much time as they should in the museum myself included and I'll say that because I've done this little museum day event. And the museum is so beautiful. It is so well designed and it is such a cool area. And I'll definitely, especially the butterfly pavilion room, it's like beyond gorgeous. So the event is you go to these stamp stations, you get stamps, you turn them into blathers and he gives you little plaques, which look like the uh, bug fish and uh, fossil that you would get um, that are hanging above the respective doors in the museum. Um, and that, and that's pretty much it. It's really, really simple. It's not crazy. It's, you can knock it out literally in like 10 minutes if you wanted to, uh, but it is cool to see your museum. And then the other big story this week is, uh, people have been hacking trees. And so what they've been doing is hacking the save file, and then they can effectively make trees grow literally anything almost. And so the big one that they've been doing is they're making them, uh, grow star fragments, which these are beautiful. Like if oh, I was yeah. going to hack my game, it would be to make these. So I've seen some of these islands at night with these star fragment trees all over the place and they emit the light off of them. And oh, they yeah. are it's so cool. They're beautiful. Dude. <laughs> they're yeah. So like, cause cool. like people have like the glow mushroom things, the tall yeah. glowy mushrooms and then the star trees. It's just like, Oh, uh, my favorite one that I saw was a tree that had trees. <laughs> yes. I love that. They're, <laughs> they're like tree a trees. tree growing tree. So it has little tiny trees on it. Cause they can hack it to grow like, anything so it was like a tree growing money trees like what <laughs> like what is happening could you make it grow like the most expensive item in the game and that would be like a way to like mess up the economy like it would grow leaves of you know i don't know some laptop that's like two hundred and fifty thousand bells or something like that could it do that i mean in theory you can it they're hacking it to grow all sorts of items yeah, so i huh, think okay hmm. i think there's ways to do it it's it's super bizarre um but anyway, those star fragment trees are beautiful. Um, and yeah, I mean, those are really the two big ones. One other funny story that happened this week is uh, some Robin Hood type guy is giving away Raymond. So if you're not familiar, Raymond is a newer villager in uh, Animal Crossing New Horizons. A little cat villager and uh, people are going absolutely nuts over him um, because he doesn't have an amiibo card. You can only get him in game. And so I've seen him selling on all sorts of like Facebook groups or, or on uh, Reddit trade threads. Uh, people are like, Hey, I'll give you 500 Nook mile tickets and 20 million bells for Raymond. Like just these absurd numbers. He's, he's breaking this economy as a villager. And so some guy uh, hacked his game file and has just been giving Raymond out to anyone who asks for free to help balance out the scales of the game. Um, and I think, you know, he can only give out so much and he can only do so many, uh, of these, but it, it's just so wild to see a character in game who people are going so crazy over that they're like bankrupting themselves to get him. Oh, JD, you forgot to mention the guy's name. His name is Raymond Hood. <laughs> 
the worst. I'm, I'm the worst. so sorry. I did forget to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, one thing I saw this week at <laughs> Animal Crossing was people making fake gardens, essentially. Yes. Like, because there's no gardening in Animal Crossing. So I've just seen a lot of beautiful screenshots because initially I thought it was, oh, shit, gardening is coming. This is a leaked pic. And then God, when I, I kind of like zoomed in, I saw like what it actually was. And it's just people being really creative. The creative yeah, the creativity in this game, man. It's just there's no balance on it. I know people do some stupid cool stuff and I don't get it. Oh yeah. Anyway, um, I hope gardening does come and that's pretty much all we have for this week in animal crossing. Not a lot, not a lot to talk about this week. And so I think that'll take us right into our scouting report. We have three, um, kind of big stories. I think that are really a lot of sub stories, right? And so the first thing, there's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about with Epic. And so if you want, you can lead us into this first story because I know how passionate you are about it. I am a big Christopher Nolan fan, man. Inception's one of my favorite movies of all time. And he's, you know, of course, The Dark Knight, everyone loves it. But our main man, Christopher Nolan, he premiered the second trailer, the first real story trailer for Tenet inside of Fortnite. And we're just going to keep having these these yeah. events, I think. This is just, this is a new norm for us. We're going to have exclusive things happening inside of games, specifically Fortnite like this for forever now. And for me, like you, you could have said, a hundred directors and i would not have picked nolan to do this like he seems like the dude like he's the guy who wants to still have his movies play in you know 70 millimeter film and imax like he's the guy who's like hey i'm shipping out special projectors to places so you can watch interstellar the way i intended you to do it like like, this is the what what who convinced him to do this and then answering my own question epic with all the money like that's the answer well, not even that, but like, uh, there was this tweet thread that was going around, um, where basically they were sa- the one of the guys at Epic, uh, who's in charge of like creative partnerships, was saying, "Hey, you know, I was talking to Nolan. He he was telling me how he wished that he could debut this trailer in theaters because that's the way he'd want it to be seen." And so then he's like, "Well, we have this big theater in Fortnite," and it was like, "Dot dot dot." Just kidding, unless. And yet here we are. Uh, and so it's just so bizarre to me that this was the the workaround for, for a guy like Nolan who's like, I want people to see this in theater. But in, in game where someone's just dabbing in front of me over and over again seems like the most appropriate uh, alternative. And it, 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 it's so bizarre. It, it blows my mind. But I think you're right that this is the future of this party island. This is what's going to... This is what it's going to be used for is this really massive promotional collaborations with outside of games mediums. And that's kind of exciting and it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's very exciting because Nolan even confirmed that he's bringing another one of his movies to the Party Royale Island over the summer. So (laughs) no word on what movie that is. I hope I hope it's Inception. Okay. Okay. You hope it's Inception. I was going to say it's probably the Dark Knight, but then you'll know. download Fortnite and <clears throat> uh, you'll have to launch into Fortnite and go with your little no skin avatar to go watch this movie on Party that makes me That makes me so sad. Please, I just I, also <laughs> I want you to know when I was trying to lead you in for this, I didn't know Christopher Nolan was one of your favorite directors. So when I said you're really passionate about it, the joke was going to be how passionate you are about Fortnite, and I wanted you to get mad at me, but instead you really took it and ran with it, and you've really ruined the joke. That I, was oh. trying to set up. I know because I actually I really do love Nolan. I was going to ask you like the trailer was really effing cool, right? Did you see it? Have you? It was amazing. Oh, just. <laughs> This is going to be a great movie. There's no doubt about it. Um, so but- <laughs> I've I've seen seven minutes of it because they released uh, one of the scenes from the movie in IMAX, oh. kind of like how they did with The Dark Knight, how they released oh, the bank cool. heist ahead of time. Yeah. They released uh, a full snippet from this movie doing this this, this stuff. It like I, I could not like describe how excited I am for this movie because it's, it's so going to awesome. be good. It's going to be so good. I'm oh. so hyped. I'm, okay, I'm stoked. Point. Okay, so next next epic story we have. Um, so we talked about it last week, the uh, Unreal Engine 5 demo. They debuted it on PlayStation 5 um, and talked a lot about how the PlayStation 5's hardware architecture made it possible. And they didn't explicitly say, this is something you can only do on these consoles, right? But they they talked a lot about the the game the game hardware and the engine working together. It was implied, I think, a lot. 
Well, it turns out it runs just as well on a PC laptop. Um, so an engineer in Epic China gave an interview, which they very quickly were able to walk back and delete that interview. Uh, but basically, they ran this tech demo on a laptop, and it almost ran it better, right? So where the PS4 was averaging around uh, 30 frames per second at 1440p resolution, the laptop was able to get 40 frames, so it squeezed out an extra 10 frames at the same resolution. And so... It, it you know it's it's pretty funny um that in and of itself is hilarious so then on twitter people were asking uh tim sweeney hey dude like what 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 gives and he was very dismissive about it and he was very uh not confrontational but very uh you know trying to sidestep the question i think and so at one point he finally just told someone like hey i'm not going to give you any details because all this next gen hardware is under a non-disclosure agreement still but next year we're going to release the public preview of the engine and you're more than welcome to dig in and look at it all yourselves <laughs> so <laughs> so it's kind of like a big you know f you i'm done talking about this go buy a playstation 5 like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> he's just like gotta like get uh ps5 tattooed on like his collarbone and just pull it down <laughs> so he can be like i promise sony i'm trying like I, please i'm on your side <laughs> <laughs> so uh our next story is about uh, partial refunds happening in the epic game store if a game goes on sale and for for me that's just like a good guy move that Epic didn't yeah. have to do. And yeah. I think it's going to kind of tie into the next story that I want to talk about too, essentially where if you have this like effort money, you can really be a source of good. Cause like, there's a lot of times where like, like these Kings back in, you know, like the 1700s were just <laughs> amassing this gold. Like they were freaking a dragon in a lair. And it's really cool to see Epic committing to giving the riches to the people. I mean, we talked about it last week with them, with their first million that you make is for you and your game. We're, waiving our royalty fees and then right. now this kind of thing this is this is like incredible like epic's really doing good stuff man how do you feel about it it's it's amazing because it, it bucks the old version of doing it which was hey if this game goes on sale what you have to do is effectively return and rebuy right and that's kind of a pain in the ass and and i get it like that's just the way it is it's the way it is on on steam still right mm -hmm. and so this is just a really good um quality of life change that they didn't have to do and i think a lot of people are stunned that they did because no one's used to it right no one has seen this a lot of times with digital purchases you just kind of get burned right if you buy a game mm -hmm. and it goes on sale the next week you just you just kind of get burned and it's like well that sucks like shame on me i guess whatever right um and so it's really cool to see them doing this where if you buy something and it goes on sale they're just automatically refunding the difference and you're right they get there by having this pile of cash that they can they can do that with. It gives them a lot of flexibility to be that better storefront in some ways compared to Steam. Um, and I, I, I very much hope that Valve follows suit and does the same thing. And I think that's the big, you know, we can look at this as just a single feature. But I think really what we need to do is examine this as how is Epic games and how is the epic game store going to really push this digital storefront war to be better for consumers and you can make the argument that epic game stores exclusives are bad and blah 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 sure but like look at steam for so long they had literally no competition and it caused them to get really stagnant and steam is kind of like a bloated piece of garbage software it's not very good and mm -hmm. the storefront is not very user friendly and so like epic and like epic game store or not like at least this a massive amount of money they have to splash around and make these big moves has to force valve to do something with steam to make make it better yeah. so if you look at it as a microcosm of just a single feature sure like this is great and it's great epics doing this and i hope steam does it as well but also if you take that back and peel a few layers back i hope that it makes them both fundamentally shake up the industry as a whole i know i completely agree with you because last week we talked about the moves that epic games is making with their game engine we're going to force unity to maybe make some changes so now this week the moves that they're making with their platform are going to maybe force valve to make valve to make some changes and our last story here really the main thing that i just wanted to highlight about how these platforms how much money they're making from microtransactions i can't even fathom it because oh the, the next little highlight we have on our doc here is basically how 
how much money Grand Theft Auto makes for the Epic Game Store. And I, that never even crossed my mind, Grand Theft Auto Online, how much. Like, I know. The only thing I see on TikTok is the greens versus the purples. And I'm like, I guess purples because that's royalty. <laughs> and that's the only thing I know. But then it's so crazy to think that like every microtransaction that goes through that Epic Game Store or all the money that's being made, because like that's a 2K game. Like that's that's yeah. not ep- Epic. and But they're still making money on the back end too of something like Grand Theft Auto and how... Grand Theft Auto Online, that never crosses my mind that there are microtransactions in that game. But there but are there's millions a of them. A ton, millions yeah. Of them. Maybe even more or just as many as Fortnite. And also, that uh, a percentage of that is being put into the pockets of Epic. And it's just cool Absolutely. to see them doing good. Like It's so weird to, to, just, to just feel like they are making they're they're making important changes to the gaming industry if i'm thinking about any company right now especially in this last you know two year life cycle it's nintendo with what they're doing with the switch and epic with what they're doing with their 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 massive amount of money yeah i agree um i i love it i i really think it's great and I'm very curious to see how epic continues to shake things up not only on the development side but also as they kind of roll out more of their online services that are available to publishers and developers and and then what that translates to from a consumer standpoint in the store um because you know as we talk right now grand theft auto 5 was it was free it was the free game for a bit in the epic game store and right now civ 6 is the free game in the epic game store which is another like fairly new huge franchise game and i love civilization so this was instant for me obviously it's free game i of course got it but like i had already bought civ 6 over on steam and so i just added it in just to have it as well and it's it's yeah it's they are making moves man they are they're doing some crazy stuff it's it's nonsense they're smart that's a they're just smart they're super smart. So, okay. So that, that rounds out our first bit about Epic. And then we'll move into our next story, which is all about Pokemon. So I will let you take it away. My friend, it's so great when you learn details about Pokemon, like after the fact. <laughs> it's one of those things where like, you can't believe that like, oh, that's why this happens or how this <laughs> became to be. So apparently sure. one of the Pokemon writers had revealed that Lugia was not made for any of the games, but specifically made for that movie that he came in. So it's interesting to see, and you would never think with a franchise like Pokemon that the movies would lead the game design because Lugia was not intended to be made for the games. He was made for that movie story arc. Right. Yeah. So this all comes. So there's a Pokemon historian named Dr. Lava, and he Mm -hmm. found a bunch of old posts from one of Pokemon's lead writers for the anime Um, last name. uh, So his name was uh, Takshi Shudo, I believe. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. So Mm -hmm. he, he posted a ton and then Dr. Lava had a lot of these translated so that they could kind of figure out what was going on. And so, like you said, Lugia was typically in the process of the anime. They never, ever, ever had the rights to make Pokemon. They just had to use what the game development team gave them. Mm -hmm. And that was flipped on its head for the movie where they gave Shudo the ability to make a Pokemon. And so he made Lugia for the movie. And then the game dev team liked it so much that they took Lugia and put him, put him in the games, right? And so he, he outlines in this post that it was really not ever supposed to be that way. Um, and he was very, very shocked that uh, Lugia ever made it out of, out of his story arc and into the games. And I love Lugia and I, I'm, a big fan and it's so crazy to me to think that this is a, a pokemon that may have never existed if if the anime and the franchise of the tv shows and stuff wasn't doing as well as the games you know it, it's just it's just crazy to think of i can't imagine gold and silver without lugia because especially because right. ho is such trash like what a, what's so funny <laughs> is he's like the the most hispanic pokemon because he looks like a, a mayan like aztec like bird from like classic right. um, like <laughs> temple stuff but i do yeah. not ride for ho at all he's crap no. it's lugia all the way buddy all day all day i'm with you 100 percent. yeah it's <laughs> it blows my mind how much uh uh how much i like him and then another interesting uh thing that was revealed from uh from uh takshi shudo's posts was that uh, he originally was planning to kill ash at the end of mewtwo strikes back um and so there was a lot of details in this post. They were all extremely dark um, showing like Ash as an old man and like all of his Pokemon are like implied to be dead because they're nowhere to be found around him. And he's like looking at old photos and 
uh, it it was really sad to actually read these and then imagine that that might have happened. I I would be so so into that. Like no, <laughs> like like I want to see the Marvel What If. Like if Ash died, like oh. that's it's what I want. It's what I need in my life. I hate that. I hate the thought of that. The thought of like Pikachu dying in this mo- anime movie. I-, I hate that. I don't want to think about that at all. So. Uh, let's not explore that and let's instead talk about these other Pokemon stories. Yeah, man. So, They're hiring, uh, which is exciting. Game Freak. Game Freak is going nuts right now on, on a recruitment drive. So they're hiring uh, graphic designers, technical artists. They're hiring managers. They're hiring a lot. And they're doing it very quickly. Um, they are doing interviews literally now as we are recording. The first waves are happening and second waves are happening in the first week of June. So, I mean, they're very rapidly trying to get people on board. Why? What do you think they're gearing up for? Uh, Pokemon gun, obviously. What? Pokemon gun, sword, shield, gun. They got to make that third one, man. You got to do it. I, I'm so mad at you. <laughs> Why? I, all right. You know what? I thought we were going to have a real nice talk about Pokemon and you're really messing this up for me. No, let's let's actually have a conversation. I hope it's for more Pokemon games, right? Maybe it's I can't imagine it's an investment into new IP. That would be exciting cuz we rarely see that from them. But like if there's a Pokemon Stadium coming to Switch, if there's a oh. new Pokemon Snap game, like let's like let's do Mario Party but Pokemon. Let's do Pokemon Party. Let's F and go. Like let's make all give the Pokemon me, games. Give me Snap, dude. You are so right. If they made a, a Pokemon Snap for Switch, I will freak out. I will go nuts. What I really, really hope though is that they are in the process of uh, not maybe not remaster. Maybe that's not the right word to use, but just sort of updating and refining the old Pokemon library to launch it on switch through the eShop. I would love Mm. to be able to replay through like Pokemon red and Pokemon like yellow and like these classic, like gold and silver. Like you just said, like if if they found a way to to revitalize those and bring them forward on the switch, I would be so happy. It would make me so excited. And then they modernize it with integration into um, the app on the phone like if you could then tie in your library with Pokemon Home, that would be so cool. That would be cool. Um, I think it's probably, jokes aside, it is probably to be some form, because I know there's still DLC coming out for Sword and Shield, but I do yeah, imagine there true. will be a middle game that, you know, does probably two more legendaries or three more legendaries or what, you know, it, it follows sure. the trend, you know, does the, the pearl thing, the, or the what diamond. Yeah. Diamond pearl. What was the, I can't even remember sapphire. Who knows? Dang yeah, it. Sa- I'm yeah. losing it. Yeah. Ruby and sapphire. Yeah. yeah and then, oh, Emerald. Yeah. Yeah. So doing the third game, I do think that they're going to make that, but I could also see, cause I believe the next game on the remake track would be X and Y, right? Pokemon X mm-hmm. and Y would be the next ones they make, or would it be mm-hmm. diamond and pearl? Uh, no, it would be diamond and pearl, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it would be Diamond so. and Pearl, yeah. Yeah, because they made Omega Red, or sorry, Omega um, Sapphire and Omega um, Ruby or whatever. Okay, that'd be kind of cool then. I'd, I'd like that. Yeah, if I it's can, just Pokemon Sword and Shield's graphics, but then it's... No, would it be Diamond and Pearl? Yeah, I guess, because yeah, Black and White's after that. Okay, yeah. I'm just getting all the generations mixed up here. But yeah, I think they will make a remake in Sword and Shield's because they already have the engine, so they could just repopulate it. That's why they need so many artists and stuff, because they just got to make the world from the original game. Update all the graphics. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably what's happening. No, and then that's... Uh, so one more story then in our little Pokemon segment here is about uh, the mysterious imposter Professor Oak, right? So he's formerly only been seen in the trading card game, um, but there was actually a sprite found. So we've talked about the 1997 Space World beta before uh, a couple couple episodes ago mm-hmm. for all the cool Pokemon that they found within that code. They also found a sprite for the imposter Oak in there, implying that at some point he was written into the story of the game and then removed... With which that makes me sad because I absolutely would have loved to see that. Um, And so uh, we've never seen this imposter Oak before in the anime, but we have had several nods to him before with like one time Jesse dressing up to look like uh, uh, a professor Oak. And obviously he wasn't right. There's these little subtle hints to this character. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's kind of exciting that this uh, imposter Oak, there's some more details getting leaked out from these blog posts from, uh, from uh, Takshi Shudo. So I'm curious to see what else comes from that. 
Uh, I think that um, Imposter Oak is just hot. Like that's my oh my headline. He's just he's just really hot. He's a hot guy. Oh okay. Of all, uh, the, I think he's he's the one with the most sauce of anyone in the Pokemon like <laughs> universe. He can definitely get it from anyone anytime. He's just like yo, what up? Oh okay. Well, uh... <laughs> speaking of getting it anywhere uh, anytime, it. Twitch. I knew it. Had... I knew it. <laughs> Twitch had a, had a little bit of spiciness this week. They had some pornography up on one of their primary streamers screens there. If you're not familiar with Pokimane, she is one of the biggest streamers in the universe right now. She rolls with the 100 Thieves gang and she hangs out with uh, uh, Valkyrie and just she, she's really popular. I would say she's probably what top 10 streamers on Twitch, maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe she's definitely 20. up there. Yeah, she's definitely up there. So she does this thing where she goes through and she looks at things uh, with fans, uh, fan submitted things. And one of the links accidentally snuck in there and it was porn. And JD sent me a video of her reacting. <laughs> and boy, is it priceless, bud. It's hilarious. Um, she's obviously extremely quick to get it off screen. And she's very shocked, you could tell, because I think she understands the implication of doing that is that she would get a suspension or get banned on her channel. Mm -hmm. And yet... She is not. She is still able to broadcast no problem. And that a lot of people are kind of pissed off about that because it kind of has this weird double standard of smaller streamers that don't necessarily make as much money for Twitch, um, not having not getting banned immediately. And yet somehow she is, you know, she's good to go because she's making them buku bucks. I don't know. I don't like the the double standard that's at play here. It's BS. I'm mad about it. Cause there's like streamers who get banned for a week for having a nip slip when they're doing like some pillow challenge and they're trying yeah. to shove a pillow into their shirt. And then when they're taking it out, they're like, Oh gosh, like not even full boob, like half of an areola or like a maybe a, like, yeah. a, like a little peak of a nipple. And then it's just like, you're banned. You get nudity on stream. And then like Pokemon's pulling up this thing and it's like full it's straight up. Oh naked yeah. Naked person it, it's on Pornhub it's like person in person thing and you're just like oh, oh yeah like okay well, it's dang. like oh okay and then she's still operating fine and it's just like uh, it's, it's not fair it's, it's not fair it's a crappy double standard um it's really it's really bad and it kind of shows it kind of ties into this next story right where Twitch has created this safety advisory council and I think the whole idea was to help you know have input on a lot of these issues around you know uh some 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 of the stuff that Twitch is uh, trying to deal with, like work life balance of streamers and protecting d certain groups in there, right? So there's this balance of content that shouldn't be allowed, and then the people making that content. And uh, the rollout of this council so far has been an absolute dumpster fire. Um, yes. Where they, the people that are on here, just they don't get it, right? Not only yeah. so that it's it's Twitch employees as well as uh, some famous streamers and some some social media experts. So it's a group of people. It's not just Twitch employees. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's so dumb. They shot themselves in the foot really hard because they obviously the people on this council don't speak for Twitch. They're not employees, but that's right. how people were taking it. So when the person in the, the story that we're highlighting here, ferociously Steph, basically was talking about how voice chat gives um, an unfair like <laughs> advantage in competitive. And then when you talk, people assume your gender, like there was like this, there's all these like politics and weirdness with this, but Twitch like just shot themselves in the foot by one, like giving this person, this co-stamp, this co-sign, putting them, you know, on the front page of the news section or like putting them up front as an advocate of Twitch. And then there's just this whole drama behind the scenes that's happening. And well, it's kind of hard when yeah. they, your creators, they can say anything and you have to, not that you have to stand by them, but you putting them on something kind of means that you stand behind them. Well, and like the, yeah, that's exactly it, right? Is like, there wasn't a clearly defined separation of the people on this council that were actually employees and the people that weren't. But what it really looked like to Twitch viewers and people on the outside looking in is that Twitch gave these streamers this weird symbiotic power of being able to strip away things that she doesn't like, right? Or that they this council of people doesn't don't mm -hmm. don't agree with. And so now all you can see, like as as a me, a, a person who watches Twitch occasionally, all I see is Twitch saying, like, here's this group of people that we've, you know, unelected and, uh, we elected and the group of viewers on this website did not elect, but we've also given them these interesting powers and a platform to speak to 
that doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily reflect what the population as a whole wants. Um, it's just so weird. It's it's a really odd way to approach this, and it it feels so half baked. Which yeah. makes sense considering the last story we just talked about, where they don't they have a clear kind of uh or what what's the word I'm looking for here? They have a clear operating standard, right? They have rules mm-hmm. that need to be followed, and they don't apply them universally to everyone. Yeah. They pick and choose, and so it feels like this is the opposite reflection of that. Where now they're putting this council together without getting a wider input from Twitch users and viewers that then are creating these subset of rules that really apply to them is it, it's so odd. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the last thing I just want to highlight is like, cause I don't want to blow by Steph's concern um, mm-hmm. that, that was raised here essentially that how, well, one, one of the quotes is that voice chat is unfair period. And I don't, I don't feel like voice chat is unfair in competitive play, but also I have never been the person in her shoes where, um, basically having someone discriminate me like if you have a feminine voice or if you are a woman speaking that someone's gonna sure you know automatically sure. assume that you're not as good at competitive games and women have to deal with all of this bs online with people like hitting on them and all that stuff but like i've never had to deal with that and i haven't done it myself personally to someone else been like haha you're a girl you can't be on her squad like every yeah. time it's been like yo let's fuck let's, let's rock these dudes in halo let's go like that's always right. how it is so i have i don't want to diminish the concern and diminish the not the hatred, but the the not not even the double standard, just the the, the perception that you have to, that those people have to deal with. I don't right. want to diminish that at all. I agree. But also, I, I don't think that voice chat is unfair in competitive play. So th- I I see both sides, but I don't. I, I think I need to like you know land in the middle on this one. Just like like I wish that didn't happen to you. That sucks. It doesn't happen to me. So maybe I need to just step back and not have the primary opinion on it and let you lead the way. Like I get it, but also you got to have voice chat and play like it's just a it's just a thing it's 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 water in the games it's, it's a necessity for me you're right like i don't want to i don't want to brush over it and say like you're you're wrong right or your opinion isn't valid because obviously that perspective is very different than mm-hmm. the perspective you and i may take into our game playing um that we that we do right together yeah, and course. separate or whatever right um but then at, at a certain point also like you can have that opinion but then when you're telling that opinion from as newly created position of power that I think is where that it gets a little tricky because yes, your opinion is valuable, but like, should it override so much else and what other people are saying? I don't know. And then uh, it's all murky. It's very ill defined. And I think it just goes back to Twitch, not handling this very well at all. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. So let's move on to something that we're not going to handle very well. It's the game <laughs> pitch for this week. Uh, so this uh, this week's pitch comes from... Uh, it <laughs> Really, it stems from your 13-year-old trauma uh, and a story that you told me. And... Um, I don't I don't even know really where to to take this one. So basically, you um I need you to tell the story. I really need you to to yeah. really walk me through this yeah, so childhood 13-year-old trauma that you shared with me. I I thought <laughs> I thought that Mushroom Kingdom Hearts was a real game. And what I'm talking about <laughs> is someone had done this mock-up and like it was in a not like it was like a fake magazine screenshot. And this is I was too young to understand that people could do that with graphic like design software so it's it's like this vision and it looks like kingdom hearts like your sora jumping around to the worlds like you would for disney but it was mushroom stuff like it was not not mushrooms like shrooms <laughs> that are now legal in colorado like mushrooms like freaking mario like toadstools and stuff like that but the idea of mushroom kingdom hearts would essentially be you know you're going to your metroid worlds, your animal crossing worlds you're you're, you're traveling to all the mushroom kingdoms and it's yeah that's so i thought that it was real and i thought it was real for years and i had you know people who i would approach and say like oh this is real (laughs) like i I promise i saw it it's a thing and then they would like it's just like the first time that i got shit on and the internet was responsible (laughs) and it just really hurt me um where did the name for this one come from i don't even know (laughs) i don't remember i don't remember we'll have to go back through our text okay i'm not I'm not going to say it. We're going to just say it was called Mushroom Kingdom Hearts, and maybe we'll tuck this name away for a different day. Um, 
<laughs> but give, give us a real game pitch, please, because well, this is okay. the worst thing I've ever heard. So No, because Mushroom Kingdom Hearts, I think, would be a really good game, like, regardless. Like, we would just love the name, it. The just... name that I have on this document would not be good. So no. go ahead and give me something better. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to stick on our Kingdom Hearts train and do three of Kingdom course. Hearts pitches in a row. Just to Damn it. be real terrible. So uh, I have a pitch for you, and I don't know if you're... You know how um, when people are pitching like their um, app idea, they're like, okay, it's like the Uber of this. It's like, oh, the, yeah. yeah. So it's like that. <laughs> it's like, it's like Uber for microwaves or whatever, whatever the thing is. <laughs> <laughs> so this idea, it's, it's a Kingdom Hearts Battle Royale. Oh my God. Yes. And if you don't know, so Kingdom Hearts has uh, one of those foundational moments called the Keyblade War. Are you familiar with the Keyblade War? You could give me give me the highlights. It's it's basically the Order sixty six of Kingdom Hearts. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So there's a bunch of Keyblade people. They all die. There's this place that you can go to <laughs> called the Keyblade Graveyard, where it's like basically it cuts different paths to like the dawn and the the, the whatever out of okay. everyone's yep. dead Keyblade. So all the Keyblade wielders die, and there's just their Keyblades are in this place called the Keyblade Graveyard. So my idea, because they've never actually let you play the Keyblade War, is to illustrate the Keyblade War as a game. And I think it would be okay. really cool to do. And this is actually my, this is, I actually think this would be a fun game is if you had a melee based battle Royale. So you all have keyblades, and all of the projectiles are magic. So you can upgrade, you know, do thunder. You could do lightning, all that nonsense. Um, all the final fantasy upgrades, Fiaga, you know, and it just upgrades, but that's what you find in chess. You find different magic, you find different, um, you know, uh, materia essentially uh you find yeah. different summons but i think the the way that fortnite switches out their map with different uh updates to hey it's like oh now the the shrieking shack is now underwater or now that this thing is yeah, a volcano a meteor hit yeah yeah so basically my thought is that every time you load in there's seven slots in this large battle royale map and they're all randomly generated with Disney worlds and that the wind conditions change for some of them. So maybe one time the wind condition is finding all 101 Dalmatians. And so as you mm. travel these kingdoms, so you're like running around a place that looks like Wally, you're running around a place that looks like Wreck-It Ralph and the things you're finding in chess are Dalmatians. And as you melee Keyblade battle someone, you pick up all their Dalmatians off of them. And then whoever has 101 at the end wins because you're the last person standing essentially. Okay, interesting. I like that. What's this like game going to be called? Uh, well, wait, there, there's also an underground system oh, too. Cause oh, okay. like, cause like, you know, the, the, the cave of wonders, like, yeah. I, I think that like not a lot of battle rails have like a, a high, like verticality to them. I know you sure. like drop in like from, and you parachute in and stuff, but I mean like, I want like, there's like an underground and like, sometimes it's the seven dwarfs mine and sometimes it's the cave of wonders and so, you know, so just different yeah. underground type things. But I feel like Disney could make a lot of money just being like, Hey, here's a little interactive park and there's seven of them and you run around and it's like Disney world, but also you're battling people with keyblades and murdering them. <laughs> 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 um, so what's this game called again? I don't know, man. Just probably keyblade war. Maybe keyblade kingdom, wars. Kingdom, kingdom hearts. hearts. Battle King Royale. I mean, okay. kingdom. Uh, kingdom rip out their hearts i don't know oh no i don't like that no. uh disney will never go for that so <laughs> kingdom hearts keyblade war so now we've done okay. three kingdom hearts pitches in a row yeah it's something i can't tell if our quality is going downhill or drastically uphill i don't know um, i don't that yeah i can't, can't <laughs> uh so we have a red card to give out and uh it's not a this isn't explicitly game related, though I do think it will have some implications to the game industry over time. So um, a couple days ago, uh, Facebook effectively told employees that they can continue working remote, <clears throat> though if they choose to leave the Bay Area, so maybe they want to move back home or, or move somewhere that doesn't cost literally every penny they make to live in, um, that they are going to adjust their pay accordingly and so effectively you know let's say you moved to san francisco to be a software engineer for facebook and you make 125 grand right just throwing numbers out and then you decide you want to move back home and, and you live in new mexico or you live somewhere significantly cheaper right facebook's going to take that into account and change your pay even though you are doing the exact same amount of work and you are making them the exact same amount of money you will no longer make the same amount of money because you don't want to live somewhere that's crazy expensive. And my fear, and I think your fear, and you can speak to this a little bit more, is that this is going to ripple into the game industry. 
Yeah, I completely echo that. And actually, I reached out to one of my friends or this, I had kind of this conversation about the same thing with one of my friends who uh, used to be in the tech industry. And apparently that's something they already do in the tech industry. Weird. This was not like, I was like outraged by this. I was like, what the heck? How could you do this? And apparently it's already happening out there. So this is scary. And I bet, yeah, yeah, like you said, man, I bet a lot of game devs might do this. If, especially if this, you know, unprecedented time that we're in right now is going to allow more people to work from home. I wonder if there's going to be more studios that might just be remote studios just in general. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a there's a massive pro to it all, which is I genuinely hope that we see a lot more remote opportunities in game development because I think that's we live in a, a in a, a time where you can get so much work done from anywhere with with you know really consistent results, and I think there's a lot of talent in places where people aren't always in a position to move and to to be able to contribute still and get these opportunities without having to physically relocate i think that'd be huge um i hate the idea though that a huge tech giant like facebook will certainly cause a ripple i think in the pond for lots of other companies down downstream from them and it just makes me worried that it's going to lead to people being taken advantage of or feeling compelled to to live somewhere they don't necessarily want to just so that they can get paid what what's probably fair. Yeah, like a, let's say you're an environmental artist and there's someone on the team who's mm-hmm. two years your junior as far as experience goes, but you have the same title. And just because you're in Wisconsin and they're, you know, in California, that they're making, you know, significantly more than you. I don't think that that's yeah. fair. That, no, that doesn't seem right. But I guess from a company's perspective, because me and you were both really excited about studios maybe having more remote opportunities maybe for us to get those remote opportunities, it's good. That's going to be the concession. It's like, you know, you're not commuting right. to work. You're not doing this or that. Um, I just don't like it. it. It rubs me the wrong way. It feels icky. I, I get it. Like I understand your company, you have a bottom line, but also if pe- two people are doing the same work, you should probably have similar pay. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree fully. Um, yeah. I guess we'll just have to keep an eye on this and it is weird to see that, there are a lot of companies that already have this in place and maybe it's because they aren't as big or maybe it's just because the current global situation that we're in, it didn't warrant necessarily a big headline before. But then when you see a company like Facebook, which has literal billion users, right. And massive revenues, maybe that's going to cause, cause it to become a, a much bigger deal than it was before. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see kind of kind of where this goes. Um, but that's our red card this week. It goes to Zuckerberg. Uh, he's the worst. And <laughs> that's the end of our show. Uh, Eli, anything else you want to add? No, thank you, viewers. You're the best. I like your faces. Thank you for listening and all that. Yeah, everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, there's a ton of ways you can get in touch with us on Twitter and Instagram. We're at Game Pitch Pod. I'm at J to the D, and Eli is at Mario RPGino. On YouTube, you can find us by searching at Game Pitch Podcast. You can email us uh, questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings, your own game pitches at Game Pitch Podcast at gmail.com. And we are all over the place. So we are on Apple, Spotify, Google Play. We have a YouTube channel. You can find us, like I mentioned, on Twitter and on Instagram. And yeah, find us, talk to us. We we want to hear from you. We out there. The followers is growing. What, what would the game pitch audience be called? The pitchers? No, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. You down with the GP? Yeah, you know me. Yeah, they're the funky bunch. I'm down. Oh, the funky bunch. Uh, We're going to workshop that and we're going to get back to you guys. But again, thanks for listening and we'll catch you next week. Bye, guys.